Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News. Well, what an amazing week on the markets. We've got so much DeFi news to get through. We're gonna cover all the macro headlines first and then get into that crypto news. We do welcome a few hundred new subscribers. I have been a little bit quieter than normal on YouTube, guys, but I did a longer write-up in our group this week, but I just wanna assure you that there is so much happening behind the scenes. Um, so if you don't get five videos a week, don't be too worried. We've got some very big things which you're gonna be finding more details about uh, in the coming days and weeks. I'm gonna talk about a few of those in tonight's episode as well. But uh, needless to say that the research uh, and some of the presentations and conferences that I've been invited to are taking up more of my time. But we are gonna try and get out um, more videos, so hopefully more than two each week uh, other than the market update. But there is a lot happening behind the scenes and I guess it's all just coming together, isn't it? You can see the world of DeFi is really taking off. Now, if you're new to the channel or you've got those friends and family that are getting interested in this space, we continue to add to our free resources hub. So just head over to nuggetsnews.com.au. We're continuing to add the topics that are most requested as well. If you ever want a topic, just contact the team at support and we can um, make these units for you. We've got 100 on our to-do list. We want this to become the one-stop shop for everything cryptocurrency related, as well as all our partners and affiliates, which you'll find over on our website as well. Uh, particularly our, uh, our sponsors and our partners that are so generous with what they give away. So that $100 free Bitcoin is still available for those of you that are interested in trading stocks or currencies. Now, a lot of the talk around the bond market and all those bond ETFs. Now, eToro recently added stock trading and zero fee trading on a lot of their US stocks, which I know a lot of people have got a bit of an appetite for at the moment. But we're going to talk about the good and bad of all of that uh, as well. And finally, a big welcome to uh, 54 new members this week into our premium services. We've done further updates, welcome videos. Be sure to read that pin post if you're new to the group so you know how to get the most value out of your members. Uh, and if you want to do those learning units and look at my portfolio, that's all in the unit section here on that tab. And we are very close to launching our website portal for those of you uh, that don't like Facebook as well. Okay, let's get into the local news where the Australian government came out this week and admitted that they've been under a massive cyber attack in the government sector, private sector for a couple of weeks. And that was interesting because I've spoken to friends that are working for these affected businesses and it is actually something that is being held for ransom for Monero for one of the cryptocurrencies at this stage. So yes, that is starting to affect a lot of the Australian businesses. And obviously there's all these rumors about who's doing this. Is it a country, a state-based uh, actor because of some of the geopolitical tensions out there, but I won't get into those details too much other than to say I'm looking forward to hearing what you guys think about all that in the comments below. So look, Australia is still the lucky country. We do have to make it that way though. We've got a lot of resources here. We do have a lot of wealth tied up in our superannuation system, but it's a matter of deploying that wisely into new industries rather than just rehashing all those things that we're so, you know, you know we are so good at them, but we're just not um, diversified enough in terms of economic complexity, which I continue to talk about. And that's a theme that came out again this week where Scott Morrison has announced fast track of uh, 15 or so projects that he's talking about. Uh, not huge in terms of the spending. I think it was around $70 billion what they've announced so far. And by fast tracking, they mean bringing it forward uh, two years instead of the three year process, which it normally takes for approval. So I was kind of joking how we see China build these bridges over a weekend or hospitals within a couple of weeks. And in Australia, it still seems that fast track means we're you know still gonna two years before they get that approval. And I really think if we're heading into a recession or possibly worse, we need things now, we need jobs now. Now the MBN, finally it's completed and I know Kevin Rudd, uh, I kind of joked here in the comments, he's been waiting waiting to uh, tweet this for a very long time, I'm sure, but uh, he's saying here that only 17% of homes have fiber to the premises and um, under labor, they were talking about 93%. So look, I try to keep these videos politically neutral and I'm sure things wouldn't have gone to plan under labor either, but 
with the world that we're currently living in, working from home and the digitization of everything, we need a really good internet system. And I've got friends that can't get fiber to the premises. They, you know, they can't get satellite either, and it's very frustrating. If we want Australia to move forward, we need a, a nationwide, high-speed, really good quality uh, internet. All right, so the RBA are asking questions of this stunning uh, sex rally, and I kind of joked on Twitter throughout the week that Philip Lowe is too honest to be a central banker. And I, I've said this a number of times, I think he's a really nice guy, he's a really good guy, and he's one of the only central banks that's actually calling this out and saying, it doesn't make sense while we're seeing these huge rallies. Now, he's only saying the ASX to sort of stay in his corner, but I'm sure he's thinking the exact same thing about the US and all these other markets. And um, he knows that he's gonna have more of a mess to deal with if these markets crash further down the line. So Scott Morrison has come out and said that they want international students back from July, and he's saying that that Australia-China relationship isn't injured. Something I touched on last week, but now that we know about these cyber attacks and some of the rumors that are going around, I think it's really interesting that we're trying to speed things up and repair that relationship with China. Now, some people are saying it's just the media that are blowing it out of proportion, but I do think there's some tensions there, all stemming back to Australia pushing for that uh, independent review into how COVID started. But again, am I wrong? You guys let me know what you think about that down below. One of the big moves we saw from the government this week was changing the cost of certain degrees. Now, the in-demand um, jobs, they want to drop the fees to make it cheaper and easier. And some of the courses they've decided, that the best way to, I guess, penalize or prevent people from doing them is raising the fees. So some of these sort of um, arts degrees and others, I think lawyers was one of them. Apparently, you know, we've already got enough of those. So I think it was even doubling the fees in some instances. Is that going to make you change what you're studying if you're thinking about it? Or is it like in America where people don't really think about their hex debt? You know, this is just all just a number that they know they need to pay off over years and years. So it doesn't matter the cost. Are you going to do whatever you've been studying and whatever's your passion? Uh, that is something that I'm really interested to see how that does play out. Now, the Australian borders are likely to stay closed. We're talking international borders here until at least next year. So yes, tourism is gonna take a big hit. It's a big part of our economy, but we've also got these state-based borders where we've seen a bit of a war of words and some tensions. And just this week, Victoria started to creep up the number of cases. So this is the same in the US. Some states haven't even had a decline. They've actually been increasing in number of COVID cases the whole time. And yet the news cycle and politicians are talking about this unlocking. So I just think there's so many unknowns. And again, that's just maybe being cautious for the health side of things. I'm not too worried, but I'm just saying stock markets are forward looking. And at the moment, they're pricing in perfect conditions. They're not thinking about the possibilities of maybe a second wave or you know the tourism, education, a lot of these things that we're touching on in these sort of videos. So interesting tweet from my mate, avid commentator. He was saying that um, one of the stress tests back in 2017 was along the lines of having a 4% 4, 4 fall in GDP and 10% unemployment, uh, and that could lead to a 35% correction in housing. That was their base case. And sure enough, we are at those conditions now, and yet no one is talking about that as a possibility, that that, that actually, could happen and that would really stress the banks. So it's interesting that they say one thing and now we're here, obviously doing another. Now the biggest story this week, and some people are saying that the words have been twisted and this has been blown up by the media, um, but the Reserve Bank, the fact that they're even talking about this, I think reveals a lot. They considered asking real estate uh, agents and you know pausing the real estate market, trying to stop transactions amid property crash fears. So they were talking about a 15% crash, um, as we just touched on then. In the past, we've heard from regulators that a 35% crash would be on the cards if we have the conditions which we currently now have. So that's why we've seen huge efforts to put out these you know, first homeowners grants in Tasmania. I think WA, there's a, a builder grant as well you can get. So it's basically forty-five dollars or $50,000 money um, for JAM to build those houses. A lot of builders we're talking to are really booked out here in, in Tassie. So look, that's great, but it does remember it pulls demand forward. So once all said and done, that drops off again, and then you've got to launch a bigger program or get people to go into more debt to keep that growth going. That's just the, the mathematics of a debt-based economic system. 
So Australia have done a pretty big chunk of stimulus compared to a lot of other countries around the world. And it's China's turn now to step up and the central bank promising to expand credit by up to 30% of GDP in this year alone. So they're pretty far down that list there. Um, compared to some of these other countries that have gone foot to the floor very early on. Uh, and this is an interesting dynamic depending on what country you're in, but the mix of austerity and people that are worried about debt versus those that are talking about, well, don't even worry about it. That's modern monetary theory. Don't even worry about that debt. We just need to spend, spend, spend. So China are looking to speed up their US farm purchases after a, a secretive talks in Hawaii apparently. Um, something we touched on last week and in previous episodes where China promised to spend you know, tens of billions of dollars on all these agricultural goods. And the reality is they just don't need them. Uh, and so now, I think with the economy in mind, so they're looking to maybe get these talks back on track and maybe start stockpiling some of these uh, goods that they can't produce themselves. This is the Mobility Trends website we've been checking in on. We can see now the United States in gray is back above baseline where it was at the start of the year. So yes, people are out and about uh, versus somewhere like the UK, which is uh, still below that baseline. Then we've got the European countries in the middle there. This is something to keep an eye on. A free website over at apple.com um, to see are people out and about um, during weekdays, particularly versus the weekends is something that's um, an interesting trend. Okay, so the IMF, they're out there, they're slashing economic forecasts and warning of a crisis unlike anything the world has seen. So a bit of a change of tune compared to some of these um, not so bad temporary forecasts previously from the world players. And if we look, have a look at the number of countries in recession, we see that that's now well above 90%. So yes, I know we often focus on Australia with Martin North. We concentrate on the US a lot because it's the biggest economy in the world. But we have to remember there are so many countries out there and over 90% of them are in recession. So with the global supply chains, you know, demand it comes from everywhere these days. This is something that is a lot bigger than what markets are currently pricing in. So Eurozone, this is a good example here, a visual representation of the difference between the money that you're printing and that's all well and good to inflate the money growth versus real GDP, which is uh, taking a dive down there. And they face some, some big problems. We've seen, look, a bit of civil unrest in the US, but I think the yellow vest movement, those sort of things are going to pick back up in Europe because it all stems back to inequality and who's getting the money. And once again, we've got this block deal talking about who gets who with this rescue package and who's the worst hit countries over in Europe. And I, I just think that this is going to lead to more and more tensions. Okay, so the banks over in Europe, they're hurting because of those low negative interest rates they've had for so long. And it was only three months ago where they vowed not to fire any employees. And sure enough, you know, bankers are as good as their word, which is basically nothing. And they've started to fire all these employees now that they've got a lot of these big bailouts and they're dipping into these government funds, these loans, these programs, the bailouts. And this is what I've got a whiteboard video. It's actually uh, finished drawing up. It will be out very soon about how all this money flow works and how all these programs go into the financial world, the corporate world and the big businesses. And we're just not seeing the money go to the real economy, but even the small businesses. Okay, so it's these CEOs and the wealthy that make sure that their pay is coming in and their salary and their assets are all elevated. And I actually think the Fed want this. They want to support the big businesses because they think, well, that's who has the most jobs. But they're getting all this money and still firing people and laying off employees. Now, I joked at the start of the week that uh, you know the Bank of Japan came out and announced another trillion dollars. Last week, it was the ECB. The week before, you know, it's the US. And I was sort of joking that, geez, it must be the Bank of England's turn. It's sort of pass the baton or press the button on the printer. And you know, it's actually laughable, isn't it? Two days later, we come out and uh, the Bank of England announces uh, only another $100 billion of QE expansion in an unexpectedly hawkish statement. So what that means is they weren't talking about as big a programs and printing as some people had suspected. Maybe they're thinking that things are going to get a bit better or they don't need to flood the markets with as much money as they thought. But as we saw in those uh, charts, the UK, they are a little bit behind the rest of the world. So this is an interesting uh, change and 
the different countries, what strategies are they going to take? Is it going to be all about flooding the markets with liquidity? Or are we going to see them say, you know what, enough enough of that. It is making the rich richer. Let's focus these programs and maybe even pump money into the average citizen's bank account. And that's when we get into these talks about, well, can we have inflation? So 81 central banks have cut rates in 2020. All those banks that said that, you know, Zero wasn't even on the cards like in Australia and the US, and sure enough, they're right down there near zero. And the next step is obviously going negative. So we've got the Treasury. Um, we've seen record amounts of sales. So the largest month of net sales by foreigners on record. It's Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, China. We know these countries are dumping their US bonds. And we've also seen the US dollar lose a lot of its strength. So are, they, are these the first signs that confidence is being lost in the US dollar? Or is this just a temporary phenomenon before the US dollar milkshake theory picks up again and we have a big demand for US dollars once global commerce and trade that happens in US dollars starts to pick up again? So the Fed's balance sheet, it saw its biggest weekly drop in 11 years. And you might have seen this chart floating around. Um, you know, a bit of a t a bit of a down tick in terms of, I think it was seventy uh, billion dollars, the, the amount that it went down. But if we actually have a look at the chart, you can see it here. It barely even registers, just a tiniest little down tick. And to be honest, it wasn't even selling into the market. This was just uh, the repo facilities and some of those programs they've got going had less of a demand. So it's not like the Fed are trying to unwind and they're going to you know, get that balance sheet back down to zero anytime soon. Now, I did joke uh, at the end of the week, I think it was, was it last Sunday when stocks were sort of you know in the red that had a couple of bad days here. And I think I said, look, will the Fed or Trump come out and save markets before they open on a Sunday afternoon? And sure enough, we had Sunday night here in Australia, um, no, they're wheeled out in front of the media and the Fed announced that they're gonna start buying a broad portfolio of corporate bonds, not even, um, going through the ETF these, this time. It's just picking the businesses. They're literally picking the winners. And why this is so, I guess, frustrating to watch is that the corporate bond market, it wasn't broken at all. So I mentioned this last week that the borrowing costs, if you're a big company and you want to issue debt or even issue shares, the costs here are at record low. So they can borrow as much as they want. Why did the Fed need to print more money and give it to these big corporations when they already have everything they need and it's the little guy that's really struggling. So the Fed has monetized all the treasury issuance. Um, this is just this phony game of, you know, you you give us a bond, we'll print you money and I think the government is gonna get sick of that game and just say, we're cutting you out of that equation, we're just gonna spend the money. So the Fed at the moment, they are buying up everything and sure enough, when they took a step back this week and didn't print as much money or didn't buy up as many bonds, um, the markets had one of their sort of weaker weaker weeks, pardon the pun. But the last two weeks when the Fed has slowed down that pumping of liquidity, we've sort of seen the markets have a couple of red days, a bit of sideways chop. It hasn't been this huge rocket higher um, as we've seen in previous months. So RoboBank have said the Fed will only intervene if stocks go lower or yields go higher. So they don't want everyone selling their bonds and, and the yields going up and we end up like in Argentina or Venezuela with really high interest rates. And we obviously don't want the stock market going down. In the Fed's mind, in Trump's mind, that's just not what they're gonna let happen. And so, look, they're saying that's the only times they're intervening, but that's basically what the free market, I think, would, would decide or the direction markets would go. So the Fed are gonna keep intervening to keep these markets at these levels are basically what RoboBank is trying to say there. Now, I think that um, these stress tests are really timely. Everything we've just discussed, the election coming up, the Treasury have got a lot of money at the moment that they haven't yet spent, and the Fed are coming out and talking about doing these stress tests. So maybe we're gonna hear things like, uh, stress tests didn't go that well, we're a little bit concerned, and that's the excuse to print the next trillion dollars, or for Congress to announce these big programs, multi-trillion dollar fiscal spending heading into the election, or whether or not Trump's just gonna use that money to boost the stock market heading into the election. That's what's, I guess, next on the horizon, in my opinion, for the next few weeks. The other thing we've gotta keep a look at here is those markets continuing to price in negative interest rates. 
So if we look one year ahead, it's now up to a probability of around 50, 40% in the US and even higher, touching 60% in the UK. So look, Australia continues to say we're not gonna have negative interest rates here, but I just don't know why we think we're so special. If you look at the probabilities in all these other countries, markets are cutting, we saw that chart, everyone around the world is doing it and rates are gonna go lower. Okay, so trillions in stimulus are going basically unchecked where we don't really have any watchdogs or oversight of where this money is going and who it is going to. Now, later on in the week, we did get uh, Secretary Mnuchin come out and say that they are going to reveal the small business uh, administrator announces that the PPP borrowers who accessed more than $150,000 in a big reversal. So remember just a few days ago or last week we reported on how that they were refusing to tell who got all this money. The pressure was on. I think it's great when these things happen and they are going to have to uh, tell the world. So that is going to be interesting to see if there's any tidbits in there. And we heard that even some politicians themselves have been dipping in and getting this money, uh, which I, I just, when I hear these stats about how many people can't even afford food in America or are homeless, it just, you know, I shake my head of why the money isn't going there. Uh, not only that, there's plenty to shake your head at in America, but uh, why card shares down 60% this week as an order was unable to verify or find $2 billion. Now, this is a company that's associated with Crypto.com. Uh, Crypto.com did come out and say that their accounts are all pre-funded and this doesn't affect them at all, so just something to be aware of. But, you know, people get their knickers in a knot about you know, Tether or Bitfinex, and yet every day it's the big banks, whether it's the Australian banks that are you know, in the news again for all the wrong reasons, or you know, the US banks getting fined, Wirecard can't find $2 billion. Um, you know, this is the transparency that blockchain can bring uh, to the financial system. All right, so US recessionary manufacturing activity, this is now at a high not seen since back in the financial crisis. Uh, you know, people just aren't manufacturing at the moment. All the factories are closed. Not only that, but we've got those federal tax re receipts showing a record plunge in May. So it's raising doubts around the employment data, which is telling us one thing, saying unemployment's not too bad. It's around maybe 13%. Whereas what we're seeing here, the people that are actually putting in those tax receipts, it's a 33% fall. So look, which one do you believe? The numbers that are being fudged or those actual, the tax receipts is probably uh, the more realistic number. We know that there's 100 million loans and job losses, they're continuing to escalate. So people are skipping payments, kicking that can down the road. Can that continue? You know, Is it just bridging to the other side? At what stage do we realize that this is actually something that's permanent. We've already lost 100,000 jobs in the oil and gas sector, which we did that whiteboard video about predicting, and that has played out as we expected, even with the rebound uh, in oil prices. And millions of jobs are now at the risk of becoming permanent because you can't just go back to work. There's so many nuances and intricacies around, as a business, where you were before versus where you're going now and the uncertainties. It's some percentage, whether that's 5%, 10%, or 50%, the amount of staff you need, the goods you're gonna buy, we're just not going back to that, that number anytime soon. The other thing I wanted to mention, we spoke about that bricklaying robot that's now twice as efficient as a builder at laying bricks in certain conditions where that could work and the conditions where it couldn't. But now we've got Amazon coming out with their AI robots that are capable of you know, picking um, off those uh, deep shelves and these custom-made shelves at a far more efficient rate than an employee. So look, robotics is coming. The world is going to digital and a technological world. So guys, Use that to upskill. Think about that job. If you're a packer at Amazon, know and start to get a second trade or a bit of a side hustle. Don't just be that person that waits for a robot or something else at your business to take your role. Food inequality, uh, this continues to deep, deepen. I've already touched on this tonight, but uh, one in six adults may experience food insecurity. I've heard numbers like um, one in two single moms in America report being unable to feed their kids, one in four kids in America going without a meal at least once a week. Now, these are really high numbers considering that, that population. And obviously, look, people continue to say, what about all these developing countries where starvation is still a far bigger problem than COVID? And yes, this is all true, 
uh, we've got obesity on one hand and then people starving on the other hand. So look, I, I, you know, it's a little bit, I guess, uh, utopian, isn't it? But these are things that hopefully with technology and better supply chains, we can fix these problems and um, more happy, healthy people equals a, a better economy and a better world for everyone. Now, surprising, we had US retail sales soar. So this was a record jump in May and it was particularly held up by apparel. So we're talking about this inequality where a lot of people are struggling, but on the other hand, a lot of people have gone out and bought clothes. So I don't know about you guys, but I know friends that talk about buying extra pair of Ugg boots in winter here, some more trackies because they're at home on the couch, uh, maybe a jumper. Look, is that what we're seeing here the world over? People just buying some more casual clothes because they're at home more. Um, there's these sales on. I'm not sure. I, I don't think that this is necessarily high-end spending and people going out because they've had a, a pay rise or they've got a new job to go out and buy those sort of um, apparel. But again, let me know what you guys think about that, particularly our US followers. So second quarter earnings are expected to decline 43%. That's a huge, huge whack. But if we look forward, this is what the market is kind of pricing in. They're looking here. They're saying, well, we can see back by the back end of next year, things are going to be back to normal. So they're ignoring this, this big dip. And this is where the market and people are saying there's a huge divergence. That's where the market is for looking. But I think that number is too ambitious, I guess, is my point. So Alex Kruger, another great one to follow on Twitter. Uh, who needs earnings when you've got free money from Uncle Sam? And we can see that uh, this great chart here, I'm basically showing you that that paycheck program, the airline payroll grants, uh, corporate earnings after tax, these things are sort of cancelling each other out at this stage so that we see total corporate income sort of floating around this mark, whereas it would be obviously devastating without these programs. Uh, and they're saying that everything will hopefully get back to normal by Q4. But again, I'm just not that uh, ambitious. So corporate debt outstanding by S&P ratings. We see a lot of that debt in that B column there. We don't want that to get downgraded and get into the junk bond status. And that's where the Fed are trying to rescue these fallen angels, as they're calling them, as they fall into that junk bond status. But a great point was, you know, if the Fed were doing what they did back in the last crisis or when Enron was around, you know, should you save those sort of companies? And there's a reason that companies go bankrupt. So... Again, you've got to draw the line somewhere, and at the moment, it looks like they've decided they're going to pick the winners with their new corporate bond buying program. Corporate bond defaults, this is the US and the rest of the world. Um, huge, huge jump here in uh, May this year. It's something that we've spoke about, the CLOs, that is that house of cards where they don't want to let that get out of control. Again, another reason they've come in to monetize this. Now, Hertz had to kill their plan. Initially, they were going to sell a billion dollars worth of shares. Uh, they brought that down to 500 million, and the SEC actually reviewed this and said, no way, guys. You know, you can't put out a prospectus saying that these shares are probably worthless, but we're going to sell you $500 million of them anyway. Uh, so it looks like that's not going ahead at this stage. Uh, this is a good report. Uh, the tidal wave of bankruptcies that's coming, uh, Edward uh, Altman, the creator of the Z-score, basically his research again, sort of reinforcing the fact that we've got these companies, billions of dollars of more in debt. They can't even afford the, the interest payments on the debt a lot of the time. And it's just a wave that is coming. So look, I think the Fed, they can keep printing, but you can't, look, liquidity is different to bankruptcy. And that's what all the smart guys are really talking about. Um, you know, Raul at Real Vision has really been hammering this home that this is turning into a um, solvency crisis, whereas the Fed can only really fight a liquidity crisis. So S&P 500, talking about the technicals now uh, and the percent of the stocks with a MACD sell signal. So in the MACD, our moving averages, uh, again, I've done learning units on this, guys, free videos on the channel. Um, basically, technically speaking, and a lot of the traders are just trading off technical analysis at the moment, a lot of these stocks now are rolling over, and this is a record amount of stocks that look technically like they're due for some downside. When we look at the stocks that have been outperforming, of course, it's the retail trading favorites versus the S&P 500. If you thought that V-shaped recovery was sharp, have a look at that for an absolute parabolic 
Um, look, I, I do think it's a bubble that we could say that some of these retail stocks that are doing nothing have just gone absolutely straight up. And this is why. This is something really important that we, the next few slides we need to focus on. Young people now go into TikTok for financial advice. Some of you won't even know what that is. It's a little app similar to Snapchat where you can share short videos. So going to TikTok for financial advice, uh, we've seen Dave Portney. Now, I recorded a video with Charting Man Dan. He's sort of saying, well, he doesn't mind Dave. He thinks he's doing it more for the humor factor. But, the, but I guess the reality is he's got a million followers. And this week, he took it to the next level just pulling letters out of a Scrabble bag and, and buying those stocks. And he's kind of joking that that's how easy it is. Stocks will only ever go up. This has got all the hallmarks of a alt bubble or a dot-com bubble. And we're going to look back on all this and laugh. But I think one thing just to note is that Dave Portney famously did a video about Bitcoin. And I think whether stocks have a correction or he gets bored with them, I think there's a high chance that he's going to start talking about Bitcoin and then altcoins just like he's been doing. Uh, with stocks. Now, due to this rule change, we have to have more granular data from all the retail brokers about who they're routing all the order activity to. So the big players out there are paying you know, $30 million in March alone to Robinhood just to know what their traders are buying options-wise. So yes, we've got the, the stocks as well, but the big money is in the derivative products and these high frequency traders, they want to know what retail are buying and I think they're front running these orders and it's going to get very messy once they decide to pull the rug. Now last week we did report on that tragic story about the suicide. I have heard that there was a glitch in the Robin Hood app and over weekends it, it doesn't show the position that he had on which I think was a an options position. Uh, call spread uh, and if you know what that means uh, it basically has two positions and it was only showing the loss part I wasn't showing the other part of that position so I have heard a story I'm not sure if this is true that his account in the position wasn't actually that much in the red which is even more tragic but either way Robin Hood have come out and said that they're going to make a number of changes to the platform obviously they don't want this stuff happening but I think it just um, it goes a step further as I always say, you should not be trading things you don't understand. You should not be using leverage. You should not be trading derivatives if you are new guys. So please take those messages seriously um, when I do say those. Another thing that hasn't been spoken about a lot that we're going to look back on is the number of stories with the word buy in them were at really historically high levels compared to previous crashes. So the media were telling people to buy the dip or it's just been programmed into us, I guess, over the years. And that's probably another thing that's really added to retail investors having the confidence to step in um, because we've just got a record number of stories with the word buying it during a dip. Okay, so the NASDAQ to S&P 500 ratio, higher than it was at the height of the dot-com bubble. This is just a symptom of, I think, technology taking off as well as all that speculation. But we know that retail investors prefer the, the Facebooks, Amazon, Netflixes, Googles of the world. So it's no surprise that this, those tech stocks are outperforming. Now, this is the mother of all short squeezes here. If you have a look at the Tesla, we can see that back in 2013, we peaked with 40% short interest. So 40% of the shares outstanding were borrowed by short sellers to bet that they were going to go down. Now, with this recent rally where Tesla's ripped from $200 in 2019, um, or even on the dip, it was down under 400 up to 1000 again. Look at the um, that short squeeze. These are the guys that have just been burnt and had their positions closed and got margin calls falling from mid-30s to down to, what's this, around 10% at the moment. So you have to be so cautious and know what you're doing. And this is a great example of markets just staying um, irrational far longer than these guys could stay solvent. Some people think Tesla is worth that much. Look, Tesla is now the world's most valuable automaker. Just let that sink in for a second. They don't sell anywhere near as many cars. You know, less than 200,000 vehicle sales last year versus Toyota, which is well over 2 million. And yet that's where they are at the moment. So look, this is one that really divides people. 
whether or not Tesla is a technology company, a renewable energy company, an automaker, a software company, uh, like it or not, it's now the most valuable automaker in the world. Now they got $700 million or the CEO pocketed that much and then they did turn around to their staff and say that they're withholding the incentive pay for the time being, even to those guys that um, did do all their work. So this is you know, that, that great divide, that inequality, which we might not have heard the end of for Tesla workers. But similar story for Apple. So European antitrust officials are now investigating Apple Pay in the App Store. Uh, we see Apple facing rage and insurrection from their developers over the commission it charges um, apps on the App Store. And we've got the Justice Department looking to limit the uh, protections that all these different internet companies have had in recent years. So this is going to hit all those big tech stocks. I've said it a number of times, they're under the microscope. And if they all get hit, then the NASDAQ and those indexes are going to take a big hit as well. Uh, finally, I want to mention this interview I did with uh, Tan Lu. So one of my favorite interviews, I only think this got less than 10,000 interviews. I was expecting this one to blow up big time because it was fantastic the way that he was talking about how modern stocks have become a legal Ponzi scheme of thoughts. And some of the feedback and messages I've got from you guys about this one just been an absolute eye-opener in terms of printing stocks being like printing money uh, and never thinking about the fact you've got no ownership rights. Uh, you don't get a lot of dividends from these and the pension plans. Uh, and the fact that we had a long chat about Bitcoin as well. I just love this one. It's all timestamped, guys, so check that video out if you haven't already. But tying this all together and why I'm so bullish, I guess, on hard assets like gold and crypto, this is the percent of GDP. So the percent of your economy that these different central banks have had to do comparing it last year to the current stance. And we know that that looks like they're going to have to pick up the slack again. So the Bank of Japan, we're all turning Japanese. You know, that famous interview Steve Keen and I did last year is coming true. Look, they own basically all the bonds. They've bought all the ETFs. What else do you buy once the central bank is printing more than your entire GDP? It doesn't matter how much money you create because money doesn't create goods and services, economic activity and productivity. So look, this is the path that all central banks are going on. And that's why the world's ultra wealthy are turning to gold amid this uh, bonanza or bazooka of stimulus. Gold ETFs have just broken a record. So in just five months, they've now set that record for the most inflows in an entire year. So when we see charts like this, the actual ETF holdings, these are the good ETFs that have to hold real gold versus the spot price. I do think that, um, look, once we get above 1800, I think we're gonna target those old highs. It's a little bit like all the markets. Stocks are teetering at all-time all highs, Bitcoin's teetering around 10,000 and gold's just teetering around this 1800 mark. And people are waiting to see, does COVID get better? Are we past all this? Or central banks gonna print more money? Or are we gonna have a downturn and all markets have another correction? Or the worst case scenario, a liquidity event. So this is um, where I do trade these sort of indexes myself. When we look at the 12 month chart of gold, we can see it's been on a stellar, stellar run. Um, over the past 12 months, but it's important to look elsewhere. So look, silver has been lagging. You guys know that it's just started to catch up. I think that's more of the attractive bet with the gold to silver ratio, but particularly the ones that have been lagging are your US gold miners versus the Australian gold miners. So when we have a look at these 12 months charts, a lot of sideways chop compared to uh, some of the Australian miners that have just been on fire. Uh, GDXJ, and when we have a look at this index, which is now not so much juniors, it's more um, those mid-cap gold stocks, really sideways chop, it hasn't really broken out yet. So look, if we do get that continued upward movement in gold, I think that these are gonna provide better returns than those overvalued tech stocks, but hey, look, markets can stay irrational a lot longer than we can all stay solvent, so who knows? Is it the only sector that's not overvalued yet? Uh, are you planning on playing the gold space? Um, we'll continue to do our reports on that sector to keep you guys up to date. And if you do wanna have any of those um, gold stocks or crypto in your self-made super fund, you can do all that with New Brighton Capital. I know a number of you have taken Mike and the team up on that free consultation just to find 
find out the details, find out if it's for you. These guys are the specialists at helping you get set up, particularly with the crypto side of things, which I know a lot of other people, um, they see these other funds out there, but very few of them, if any, know how to get you set up properly with all the crypto side of things and have it in your own custody is very appealing for a lot of people as well. All right, let's get into the crypto news. And I wanna start off with a couple of bits of housekeeping because Binance have got their virtual conference coming up and I have been invited to speak at that, which I'm pretty excited about. Now, I'm not sure if this is gonna be an entirely free one. I think it is. And the other one that I wanna mention that I know does have uh, some ticket prices is the Real Vision one. So again, I've been asked to be a speaker at this. I'm super stoked about it. Um, This is in eight days time. I'm hopefully on a panel and doing a presentation for this one, but if you're a Real Vision um, subscriber to their premium content, you will get free admission to this. If you're not, I'm hoping to get you guys a discount in the coming days. So keep an eye on our socials. For members, as always, we'll try and get you guys a bigger discount as well um, for the tickets because I think they've got 30 speakers teed up and some of the biggest names in crypto and they just want to get behind crypto. Some of the stuff that Raul and I have been talking about that they want to do. Um, And I guess now is as good time as any to share with you guys that I will be working very closely with Real Vision on an Ethereum DeFi focused series. And that is where a lot of my time will be going over the next couple of weeks. But trust me, it is going to be all worth it. They want to get behind this movement. They know that there's something special there. They've seen my passion for it. So look, I'm I'm super excited to be sharing that with you guys. um, And I just can't wait to get it out there. All right, so French fintech firm announces $78 million of Paris real estate being tokenized. This is why the big boys and like Real Vision are getting behind. They see where all this is going. It's not just a fad anymore. It's it's real things happening like tokenizing real estate in the real world. Once you start to tokenize real estate, as I've said before, that gets very exciting for DeFi and loans. If I can borrow using things like my house um, as collateral. So Facebook have launched this WhatsApp Pay. Uh, It's going live in Brazil. Uh, It looks like this is their alternative for the time being rather than the basket of all the different currencies. They're going to have more sort of regional currencies and stable coins to begin with. China, they want to launch their own version to rival this. We see every week I stand here and tell you guys, Bank of Thailand launching their digital currency project. We've got Cambodia looking to go dollar free with a blockchain based payments white paper that they've put out. South Korea central bank forming a panel to advise possible digital currency launch. So every country, every corporation, you know, you guys are sick of me saying this. They all are going for this space. They want payments, they want coins, and it's making people change the way they think about money. So yes, we've got Ripple in there. They are also hot in a hot competitor in this space that a lot of rivals are coming for them though. You've got to be realistic. And there's a reason why Ripple and XRP has been one of the worst performers, I think. It's because of all this competition. But them, themselves, along with Brave and Horby, a number of others have all joined this uh, global payment pay ID uh, system. So it's a bit of a open payment coalition already, 40 members um, for this payment system. Something that we've got in Australia already is a, a pay ID system. We've got companies like Revolut announcing that they're changing their terms and uh, in future they want people to be able to be their own custodians of their crypto, which is very exciting. So if you haven't used Revolut, this is another app that lets you move between different currencies seamlessly. So again, this is why I keep saying that there's a lot of competition for uh, Ripple and XRP. Now, stable coins, that's grown 94% since February. It's up to $11 billion now. The, my digital thick shake theory is playing out. We know a lot of those different stable coins have their own inherent risks and they can be volatile. And that's why we have things like this, the Pi DAO. So this is a mixture, a basket of all the different stable coins as a token itself using the balancer pool. And you can now trade that as one token. And it I guess, mitigates the risk of the individual coins. So I really love this idea and I think it's something that's gonna continue to grow. We've also seen similar projects like um, M-Stable, which I'm gonna do a write-up for our members very soon. I think that's um, another, I guess, hidden gem waiting, uh, just waiting in the wings when I see Compound have a week like it's had, which we'll get to shortly. But the Ethereum network has logged its busiest week on record. 
the miners have voted to increase the gas limit so we can the blockchain is going to get bigger faster so it does strain miners a little bit but the community is saying look everything that's happening at the moment we just need to increase that gas limit or block size you can think of it as temporarily um, a lot of people the maximus in particular were saying that alts are dead we're never going to have another alt season but you know look at what has happened this week guys We've been very early on just about all of these coins and I own just about all of them personally. And members, you guys know my portfolio that is in the unit section if you haven't seen it. But all these DeFi projects, they went through that cycle of the you know hidden gems becoming discovered by a few people. Then we build the hype, then the traders get behind them, then the news picks them up and all of a sudden we've got all the YouTubers talking about them. And some of them, like Abe, is now up you know thousands of percent so it's no surprise when these lend token they get all the sentiment those metrics come together um and we've often said that the reason we do this research in this style of mixing fundamentals with technicals and that sentiment data is because we can tell when we're early or when we're late and we've missed something as well but we want to be before the big money the venture capital money so when we see stories like this Parify investing in, in Kyber and the industry is just booming. You know, I, I just get so excited. I hope you guys have made a lot of money as well because we were one of the earliest on Kyber when they redid their token metrics and added staking. I think we got into Kyber for 12 cents for you guys, and that's another one that's now up hundreds of percent. Um, Aave, so this is the LEN token. This is one that we covered in our reports. Uh, Matt, our head of research, was doing write-ups for you guys and talking about how he thought the change in tokenomics was extremely bullish in that write-up he did back in October last year. Uh, we then covered it in our reports for you guys, and it's now up 4,000%. So if you've invested $1,000, that's now $40,000, guys. And I'm just, you know... This is what we aim to do right here. This is an example. And you might only get one of these a year, but if you made that $40,000 from $1,000, you know, that's $500 is the cost of our yearly membership and others charge thousands for this research. So I hope you guys um, are getting value from all of this. Coinbase Pro have added uh, the comp token. So you, you can't buy that comp token very easily. You actually get it by putting your tokens in and adding liquidity into the compound protocol at the moment they're giving out that comp token so people that technically aren't capable of doing that they want to buy this token and that's why i think we've seen the price go ballistic because it's it's pretty illiquid at the moment there's not a lot of tokens floating around now i think this is a, a backwardation and arbitrage sort of opportunity here everyone's joking about yield farming but compound it's got a huge valuation now it's i think it hit 300 dollars before i went to record this video and here we have the futures price um, all the way out to september the futures are trading down for 170 dollars so the market's saying that this is going to go down in these futures contracts so if you're a trader um, have a think about how to play that and for members i did a write-up this morning on how to play it it's great to see ftx continuing to add the best projects and coins straight away for people to trade and even shorting is a healthy part that we we want to stabilize the comp price we don't want it to have a bubble and burst uh, the DeFi token index though is the one that i know you guys have been waiting for so the fact that i've added that basket this week um, it's a mix of 11 of the best DeFi projects out there uh, we've spoken about all of these in detail on the channel. Um, probably Carver is one we haven't so much, but um, it's just awesome to see that these sort of products are coming out there. But be aware that now is not the time to FOMO. We've got in early. If you've made 4,000%, you are silly if you are not taking profits now after these incredible runs. So Synthetics, another one announcing these um, yield farming products thanks to Ren and Curve Finance. I'll have Kane, the CEO, back on the channel soon to talk you through this one in detail. But we have to be cautious. So yes, there's the possibility to make 100% a year now because of these arbitrage opportunities between these different products. But that's not risk-free, okay? So when Vitalik himself comes out and says, look, there's a lot of these flashy DeFi things at the moment, but we need to be careful because these, you know, these arbitrage opportunities come with risks. Now, there are risks like if the, the coin loses its peg, the stable coin, if there's a smart contract hack or something goes wrong, 
And this is where the project like Nexus Mutual just comes into its own. So this is a DeFi insurer. Um, this is a good article about how their business is booming ahead of the Ethereum 2.0 launch because they can provide cover for a lot of these different DeFi projects. Um, and this is another one which I've done videos on uh, why I like it so much, this, this token as well. So Open Zeppelin, they found a, a big bug in the Argent wallet this week. That's already been uh, patched, so make sure you've got the latest update if you are an Argent wallet user. That's one of the mobile DeFi apps. And another bug found in Bancor. So this is why we need to be cautious because we're still finding critical vulnerabilities um, in these projects that have been out for a long time now. All right, so ETH miners are continuing to reaccumulate after we had a little bit of a sell-off from them a few weeks ago, which is great to see. A number of projects now are joining the Ethereum 2.0 staking pilot. So we've covered Rocket Pool, who are doing decentralized staking, but obviously all these big exchanges and centralized services are going to want to get in on the Ethereum staking as well. If you had a choice between the two, I would very much encourage you to do it yourself and try and keep it decentralized. We don't want to all have our Ethereum on Binance and let them you know, do the staking for us. Now, another scaling technology, Matter Labs, their ZK Sync product has come onto mainnet this week, making Visa scale payments a reality. Um, Reddit have come out to the Ethereum community and said, look guys, help us scale our Ethereum uh, Reddit point space system as well. Layer two will make Bitcoin as easy to use as the dollar, says uh, CEO Kraken. And yes, I do agree that that is possible um, years out from now. But I think that people are missing the point that we've made this journey from fiat into the stablecoin world and Bitcoin can still play its role as a digital gold, a scarce currency while being part of DeFi and being used for payments there. So this is the digital thick shake theory where crypto and stablecoins and DeFi are replacing the banks. Um, I really respect everything that Jesse Power from Kraken says and he is another guest I've confirmed um, to have on the channel. But I love this thought process from Gavin Anderson, one of the original Bitcoin OGs who said that Bitcoin can scale on Ethereum. And look, the maximalists are gonna absolutely hate that. But the fact is, if these apps are now got more users, they're more user-friendly than the Lightning Network and the, the way that Bitcoin's trying to scale, you know, there's no shame in it. Swallow your shame and say, look, this is great. We've got Bitcoin locked up on Ethereum and now we can use it that way and um, we can use the Ethereum scaling solutions. Now, Gavin Addison was also one of the uh, uh, few people that came out and said that he thought that Craig might have been Satoshi, but this week we had a lot of depositions around that court case and he actually went back on his claim and said that... Um, Look, he does have his doubts that Craig is Satoshi now after everything that has happened. So a bit of a change of tune there um, from Gavin. All right, let's have a look at the investing side of things. We've got 26% of institutions having Bitcoin, 11% having ETH according to Fidelity. Whether or not they're just referring to the futures exposure because I don't think they own the real Bitcoin and ETH yet. The custody options just aren't there. We've had another futures-based ETF being proposed. They're saying it's more likely to get passed because we've got more crypto-friendly people um, in the regulator space these days. But this is not what we want, guys. Just like we spoke about with gold, we want real Bitcoins backing an ETF. We don't want futures, okay? CoinShares, Ledger, and Nomura releasing their long-awaited custody platform. Every week, I seem to be reporting about another big player that's getting into the custody space. And another thing that I've spoken about is all this money that's swashing around the world. So $5 trillion of cash are on the sidelines from investors. We know there's a trillion dollars in just the US Treasury account. All these different players around the world that are printing money, it's waiting for a home, Stocks are overvalued. Two of the only sectors that aren't overvalued are the gold space and the gold miners, which we touched on, and crypto assets. I think if you put it in perspective, even the market cap of Ethereum and Bitcoin is just so low compared to everything else. And this money is gonna to wanna to find a home. So guys, tying it all together, um, I did just wanna mention quickly uh, about all of those reports and everything we've done. 
Um, that can all be found over in the unit section because it's something we get a lot of questions about after these videos. Uh, don't worry about the music I was listening to while I was preparing this video. Uh, this is the final slide I wanted to get to before we get into the TA. So this is the HODL waves. The amount of Bitcoins that have been held for over four years now is at a record high. So people are just hodling down this very thin supply of coins. This is the situation for Ethereum as well. Once we get into staking, We've got all these coins locked in DeFi, all these coins are gonna be locked up staking. This is all good for the store of value, the scarcity aspect for Bitcoin and for Ethereum going forward. And one of the reasons why I was pretty bullish on this trade in particular we put out last week. So when we had the, the big sell-off, you can't quite see that behind me there. Um, we did get a nice long on Ethereum at $219 and it's since bounced back trading around $230 at the moment. So when we look at the weekly charts, we're just hovering here um, underneath this downtrend line for Bitcoin. The big question for everyone is, is this a reaccumulation phase before we take off or is this a distribution phase where sellers are taking profits and when we look at the on-chain data i don't think it i don't think it is we're not seeing all these people sell we're seeing people hodl and accumulate coins so maybe we get that roll over and sell off if we have the stock market take a nasty turn for the worst and everything gets dragged down we have that correlation but from everything fundamentally that we're looking at guys i just think that i'm I'm just never been more bullish. To me, these look like falling wedges or bull flags, depending on what time frame um, you want to look at here. And we're just setting up for our next move higher. So that is everything for today, guys. A few final reminders. If you do want to um, check out all that free education, head over to the website, the Resources Hub, to become a member and join our group, get access to my portfolio and all our research. Um, head over to nuggetsnews.com.au as well. Otherwise, smash that like button, subscribe if you haven't already, share these videos around, and we'll talk again soon. Cheers.